first question, November 2021, P11. What is an essential requirement when recording the measurement of a physical quantity? Now, physical quantity, one of the first thing you would have learned is that it must have both magnitude and unit. So when you're trying to measure physical quantity, it must have magnitude, meaning to say it must have a numerical number and it must have a unit telling you what it is. If I just tell you, say, 5, but then I don't tell you the unit, what does this 5 mean? It could mean 5 kg, it could mean 5 seconds, it could mean 5 Kelvin, it could mean 5 ampere. So in order to make sense of your measurement, you need to have units, okay? In addition to having a magnitude, okay? Measurement must have unit and a number. And then after that, part 2, the mobility mu of electrons traveling through a metal conductor can be calculated using the equation mu equals to E over M times times pi. No, this is not pi. I can't remember what this oh this symbol is tau. Okay. This Greek symbol is called tau. Okay. Is e, uh, mu is equals to E over M times tau, where E is the charge of an electron and M is its mass. The average time between the collisions of an electron with the atoms in the metal is tau. What are the SI base units of mu? Okay, so this one is just simple unit analysis. Based on this given equation, the unit of mu would be the unit of E times tau divided by M. Okay, now the unit of mass, this one you can easily work it out as kg, the unit of tau, tau is actually the average time between the collisions of electrons with the atoms. So that one would also be in, the, the unit of tau would therefore be in seconds. Now, specifically when you're dealing with the unit of charge, which is E here, we know that unit of charge is Coulomb, but the thing here is that we want SI base units. So although we can say that unit of E or charge is Coulomb, this one is not base units. So we cannot use this. We need to use it in terms of base units. So one of the ways in which we can go about and finding unit of charge in terms of SI base units is that you always remember that current is rate of flow of charge, right? Such that charge is current times time. Then the unit of Q is the unit of I times T. So this one is AS. All these are SI base units. It's ampere times second. So I can actually replace unit of E or charge as AS. So eventually you will get your final answer as AS square per kg. So answer is B. All right. So this is number one, number two. Okay, number three. An aircraft hits in the direction at an angle theta east of north with a horizontal velocity relative to the air of 800 km per hour. The wind blows with a horizontal velocity of 200 km per hour from east to west as shown. Okay. So the resultant velocity of the aircraft is in the direction due north. What would thus be the angle theta and the magnitude of the resultant velocity? So what they're basically just telling you here is this. Your aircraft was moving at the angle theta east of north with a certain velocity relative to the air of 800 meter per second. Okay. Then after that, what they mentioned was that wind now blows with a horizontal velocity 200 km per hour from east to west, such that your resultant velocity is now do not. What will be the angle theta and magnitude of the resultant velocity? Okay, so here, you can try to do something like this. We know that the resultant velocity of our aircraft is north. So say this is our resultant velocity right now. Okay, we are do north. 
And then there are two other velocities that made up this resultant velocity. First was the aircraft moving at 800 km per hour at an angle east of north, as an angle theta east of north. And then second is the horizontal velocity, 200 km per hour east to west. So we know that we have one vector. This one say is the velocity of our aircraft. This one is at the angle of theta. And then we have wind velocity blowing from east to west. This one is east, this one is west, this one is north, this one is south, right? So east to west would mean that your wind is blowing like this. Okay, this is the velocity of your wind. Okay, so this one is 800, sorry, 200 kilometer per hour. And then this one is 800 kilometer per hour. So based on what the question described to you, these two velocities added up must give me a resultant that is going towards the north. Okay, so remember I told you that when you want to find out the resultant of any vectors, always draw the existing vectors from head to tail. So you draw these two vectors from head to tail, it will look like this. Okay, the gap is your uh, resultant velocity. And the direction from your initial point to final point is your direction of your resultant velocity. If this is my initial point, and then this one is my final point, I know then my resultant must be going like this, no? okay? So draw your vectors on head to tail. Make sure that the resultant gives you something that looks like this. This is describing the situation right now, okay? Yeah, this is actually what the question is already told you. They've really drawn it out for you. Aircraft velocity relative to 800 km per hour, wind velocity 200 km per hour. So that if these two add up, you give you this, the resultant going to the north, okay? So this is how your velocity diagram will look like. Now, it will form a right angle triangle. You are really just interested in finding the resultant velocity, the magnitude, as well as the angle. So since this is a right angle triangle, you can actually use Pythagoras theorem over here, where we know that it is 800 square equals to VR square plus 200 square. The 800, is actually your hypotenuse. So the other two lengths are actually your, so uh, the other two lengths should be on the other side of your equation, okay? So eventually your VR is going to be 775 kilometer per hour. This one was in 3SF if you go and find the answer, but if you run it out, but if you find your answer in 2SF, it will be 770, which is actually the answers here, okay? Now, then underneath you want to find the angle, you just make use of the two given values here. This one is opposite over the hypotenuse. So you can actually use sine. Sine theta is 200 over 800. Arc sine the value, you're going to get 14.5 degrees in 3SF or 14 degrees in 2SF. So your answer is going to be answer choice a okay right okay uh yeah uh hi regan uh we are under november 2021 p11 we just finished question three okay so we are just discussing paper one today okay so uh question three okay no issues then we move on to question four now you have a cro that is used to display a sound wave of frequency 2000 hertz the display of the CRO is as shown here. Okay. What is the time-based setting of the CRO? 
No, this one you can actually just do something like this. Now, time base setting is always time over length. Okay, sorry, time base setting is time per unit length. Okay, so in our case, apply to a CRO, you need to take the time divided by the length in centimeter that represents the time. So let's just say in my case right now, I want to find the period. Right now, this one is say my period, right? But what is the time representing this period here? The orange colored wave here. Notice that they've already given you your frequency. So frequency is the reciprocal of your period. So sum in the value, 2000 equals to one over T, T will be five times 10 power of minus four seconds. Change it to microseconds by dividing 10 power minus six, you're gonna get 500 microseconds. So here, for that one period here, you actually have four boxes. Four boxes is actually equivalent to four centimeter because this one they already told you one box is one centimeter, right? So this four box is four centimeter and this four box also represents one period of 500 milliseconds, so 500 microseconds. So you just take the time, divide by four centimeter, you're gonna get 125 microseconds per centimeter. So this is your time-based setting, answer choice A, okay? Is straightforward. Okay, so this one is fine. Then I move on to number five. Okay, so for number five, you have four possible sources of errors in the series of measurements that are listed here. You have an analog meter whose scale is read from different angles. You have a meter which is always measuring 5% too high. You have a meter with a needle that is not frictionless, so the needle sometimes slide, sticks slightly. So then the last one is a meter with a zero error. Which of these are random and systematic errors? So here you have an analog meter whose scale is read from different angles. So it could be that maybe you have an analog meter like this. And then after that, this is your needle reading. So by right, you're kind of supposed to read right over here. But sometimes maybe you read over here. Sometimes you read maybe over here. Or maybe you read it over here. Or you read it over here. This is what we meant by reading at different angles. So if you read it at maybe this position, then you do not have parallax error. Um, if you read it at this position, this one would be correct. Where you read it here, read it here, read it here, read it here, you're gonna have parallax error, okay? So, but what's the nature of this parallax error? Remember I told you before, parallax error, it can be systematic error, It can also be random error. It really depends on how you are reading it. Systematic error uh, would be when you are always reading from same angle. Random error is from different angles each time, okay? So in my case, they already told you that your reading is being read from different angles. It's actually supposed to be random error, okay? So number one is random error, okay? Then number two, a meter which always measures 5% too high. This is actually systematic error because you're always reading higher than the true value, okay? You remember the definition of systematic is that it produces readings that are always either above or below the true value. 
So it means that whatever you do, is either you're just going to see all your readings above the true value or all your readings below the true value. There will not be any mix and match where you have sometimes errors, uh, sometimes where you have readings above, sometimes you have readings below. No, if one of them is above, all of them must be above. If one of them is below, all of them must be below. So two is systematic error. And then number three, you have a meter with a needle that is not frictionless. Okay, meaning to say it's friction. And then after that, as a result of that, the needle sometimes sticks slightly. So the word sometimes here could tell you that sometimes you get correct reading. Sometimes with error. If it doesn't stick, then you get correct reading. But then if it sticks, then you have error. Okay, so this is what this is already considered to be random error in our case because sometimes you have it sometimes you don't okay so this one number one and number three are random error okay we already determined that number two is systematic so by right number four should also be system systematic error right but let's just check the meter is zero error this one obviously is systematic error lah, because one of the things we learn is that zero error is systematic error. Okay. All right, so answer is B. This one clear. And after that, we move on to the next one. Now, number six. You have an archer that shows an arrow at a target. The diagram shows the power of the arrow. Air resistance is negligible. Important point to note. The graphs show how different quantities P, Q, and R vary with time. Which quantity could be the horizontal component of displacement? And which quantity could be the vertical component of displacement of arrow? So, what they want is the horizontal component of displacement. And then the second thing they want is the vertical component of displacement. So you're trying to find out which of these is the displacement graph, the correct displacement graph for the horizontal and vertical case. All right. Now, since you notice that this is a projectile motion and they specifically mentioned to you that air resistance is negligible, it usually will tell you two things. The first thing it will tell you is that you will always have constant horizontal velocity. The second thing it will tell you is that you will have constant vertical acceleration. So horizontally is constant velocity, vertically is constant acceleration. So based on this fact, you can just try and see from here, if you have constant horizontal velocity, a graph of Vx versus T will be this. My graph of displacement versus time would thus be this because you remember velocity is rate of change of displacement. So we normally say that the value of your velocity is the gradient of your ST graph. So how will I describe the value of my velocity here? This one is constant and positive value. So this one will be constant and positive gradient. So Sx over t would be a straight line graph passing through the origin. So from here, we know if this one, this one is the horizontal one. Okay. Now then when you're talking about the vertical portion, your vertical portion is that you have constant vertical acceleration, okay? Now, this one you will have to start for your acceleration time graph. If you look at the archer shooting the arrow like this just now, your initial direction of motion is outwards. So outwards is considered to be positive, okay? 
So if I look at the acceleration, I know acceleration is always directed downwards. Okay. So because this is opposite to my sign convention, G is opposite to sign convention. Therefore, G is negative. Okay. My initial direction of motion is upwards. Okay. So upwards is my sign convention. Uh, this considered to be my positive direction. But I know that gravitational acceleration is opposite to my sign convention here. So my G is negative. Huh? So a graph of vertical acceleration versus time would be this line here, okay? This one is constant and negative value, okay? So this one is constant and negative value. Okay, so when it comes to acceleration, acceleration we know is rate of change of velocity such that the value of acceleration is equal to the gradient of my velocity time graph. So since my acceleration time graph now is constant and negative value, it will follow that my velocity time graph would have constant and negative gradient which is what you're seeing right over here, okay? It's a straight line graph with constant gradient and it's negative, okay? Now, then after that, you want to convert it from velocity time to displacement time. To do that, you use this graph, oh, sorry, you use this equation. Value of velocity is equal to your gradient of your displacement time graph. So this one, I can think of it in two ways. Let me use a different color. What color can I use? Um, I'll just use red now. Okay, you see, from here to here, this one is value less and less positive. So if I translate it to a gradient of your ST graph, it would mean gradient is less and less positive. Okay, so this one is gradient, less and less positive. Okay. Then after that, you look at the bottom part, the part where it's below the x-axis. This one is value more and more negative. So, Translating it to a gradient, gradient is more and more negative. Okay, gradient more and more negative, I'm looking at how the line changes. Okay, so in my case, I change from A to B, V to S. This is my resulting graph. Okay, so the one that shows me this is this one. This one is vertical. Okay, so answer is B. Horizontal component of displacement is graph Q. Vertical component of displacement is graph R. Okay, so this one is okay. Then I move on to the next one. Okay, so next one will be question number seven. Okay, now this one is actually one of uh, existing past year. It's actually something that you would have encountered in one of the earlier past years. They actually repeated it here. Okay. Uh, Paper one, some questions occasionally do repeat itself, okay? So the idea is that the more P1 you do, the chances of you encountering a question that has repeated itself is higher, okay? Now, two cars X and Y are positioned 
as shown in time t equals to zero, they are traveling in the same direction. X is 50 meter behind Y and has a constant velocity of 30 meter per second, whereas Y has a constant velocity of 20 meter per second. What is the value of T when X is level with X? Okay. Basically, what they're trying to ask you here is how much time would have elapsed before X will catch up with Y? As it is right now, at T equals to zero, this is where x is, is moving with 30 meters per second. And it is actually 50 meters behind car y, which was moving at 20 meters per second. You see, this one is 30 meters per second. This one is 20 meters per second. This one will eventually, because this one is moving with a higher, because vx is more than vy, it's moving with a higher speed, it will eventually cash out with y. So they want you to find out what is the time that have, would have elapsed before X will be able to catch up with Y. So you just think of it like this, no? uh, at time T, when X is level with Y, now this one is, when X is level with Y, you can think of it as being something like this. When x is level with y, x will be here, y will be here. Okay. Now, x itself, this one was at t equals to zero. This is at, wait, maybe I should have write t equals to zero. Okay. This one is. t equals to zero, this one is t equals to zero, okay? So at t equals to zero, both are at different starting points. But then at t itself, the t that we want to find, they are at the same point, same lineup, okay? So let's just see what can we deduce from here. Now, after time t, x would have traveled a distance of xx to this point. And then after time t, y would have traveled a distance of sy to this point. Okay. Now, if I try to start measuring the distances, from here to here, this one is xx. But from here to here, this one is actually 50 plus SY, okay? So when X is level with Y, you can say that SX is equals to 50 plus SY, okay? So from here, we also know this, V is S over T, so S is VT, right? To find the distance that has been moved, you just take the velocity multiply with time. Okay. So eventually what you get is something like this. SX is VXT equals to 50 plus VYT. So this one is 30T equals to 50 plus 20T. Eventually T is equals to five seconds. So your answer is D. So that is for this. Here is more like how to say. The way you look at it now, this one is, you can think of it, this one is your start point. No? And then this one is your endpoint okay then from here to here is where time t has elapsed from start to end so after time t x would have moved as x but after time t y would have moved 50 plus s y that's why my equation is this okay so that's one way to look at this.
Okay, now for B, sorry, not for B, for question A, you have a constant resultant force that acts on an object in the direction of the object's velocity. Which graph could show the variation with time t or the momentum p of the object? Okay. So one way to look at this is to look at some keywords. They mentioned to you that you have a constant resultant force in the direction of the object's velocity. Okay, let's just look at the constant force part first. We know that force is rate of change of momentum. In other words, it's the gradient of our velocity time graph. Sorry, it's the gradient of our momentum time graph, okay? Force is rate of change of momentum. It is actually the gradient of our momentum time graph. If we have constant force, it means we have constant gradient, okay? If F is, say, if F is constant, it also means that gradient is also constant. This is fact number one. So graphs with constant gradient would only be C and would only be D. But how do I know which one is which? The other thing to note here is that they told you your resultant force acts in the direction of the object's velocity. Remember last time in kinematics I mentioned to you, if this was your direction of your velocity, and this is your direction of acceleration, your object will actually speed up. It's only when your velocity is like this, and then your acceleration is opposite, that you slow down, okay? So here, I know that my force is in the direction of my object's velocity. My object will speed up. My velocity increases, therefore momentum increases. Okay, so I'm speeding up. My velocity is increasing. My momentum should be increasing. So the correct graph should be this one. D is definitely out. It's showing to me that my momentum is decreasing. Okay, so... This one is okay. Okay, number nine. Which statement must be true for an object inside a gravitational field? If the object has mass, then the field causes it to have weight. Low. Okay, so this is what, uh, I mean, at this point in time, you all probably will have already gone through A2 already, it started A2 already. You will have gone through gravitational field by now. So you would know that if you're talking about gravitational field, if you have a mass inside a gravitational field, it definitely must have a force, and that force is our action is actually our weight. Okay. So the rest of the statements here are wrong. If the object has mass, then the field causes it to accelerate. It, this one not really sensible. It Z, if the object has weight, then the field causes it to accelerate. If the object has weight, then the field causes it to have mass. Now, all this is not correct. Only B is correct. As long as it has a mass, it has a weight. Okay. Then after that, whether it accelerates or not depends on the situation. What I mean by that is this. If you have a ball with weight W in the air, it will fall down, it will accelerate. Okay, in, if it's in the air, la, if the ball is in the air, it will fall down and accelerate. Okay, maybe I better write this properly. The accelerating part of one is not something we want to bother about because it depends on the context. Okay, if object is in the air, it accelerates. So if this is our object with weight W, it will go down. So this one, it accelerates as it falls. This is number one. This one is where you, you have an object accelerating. 
But if you have a case where if object is on the ground, it does not accelerate. Like say this is your floor, the ground, and then you have your weight W. Your weight W is balanced off by your direction force R. So the object does not move, there is no acceleration, okay? That's the reason why we don't really want to bother about them mentioning about whether the thing accelerate or not, because it depends on situation, okay? But what is always true is that if you have mass and you are inside a gravitational field, you definitely will always have weight, okay? D is actually saying the other way around. You have mass, then you have weight. Not you have weight, then you have mass. Okay, so D is out. Okay, so number 10. Okay, number 10, they tell you that you have a ball of mass 0 0.16 kg that is traveling horizontally at a speed of 20 meters per second. It collides with a wall and rebounds with a speed of 50 meters per second along the original path. The ball is in contact with the wall for a time of one millisecond. What's the average force exerted by the wall on the ball? So this one, you just need to use the equation. Force is rate of change of momentum. So first find out what is your momentum change. Now momentum change this one, you need to be careful because this is vector. So you're adding or subtracting, always take into account the direction. So in my case, say for example, I take going towards the right as positive, and I'm taking the initial momentum minus the final momentum. This one would be mu minus negative mv because you see, First, it went this way, 20 meter per second, then it rebounds the other way in the opposite direction. So this one is negative momentum. Okay, so mu minus negative mv, it will become mu plus mv. So this one, just submit down here. When you say rate of change of momentum, momentum change over time will be 0 0.16 times 20 plus 15 divided by time millisecond remember to change it to second you eventually going to get the answer is 5600 newton so answer is c okay so this one pretty straightforward then i'll just clear off the diagram okay so i'll clear this thing off okay Okay, then after that, question 11 is on up trust. Okay, now you have a uniform solid block that is fully submerged in a tank of water. The dimensions of the block are x and y as shown. The block is held vertically in the position shown. The density of the block is the same as the density of the water. If the block is always held at the same depth d below the surface of the water, what single change will increase the magnitude of the uptrust force on the block? So, one of the first things we always know was this. Now, uptrust is equal to the weight of liquid displaced. So, uptrust is rho Vg, or rather is rho Ahg. If you want to have higher uptrust, you will need a higher volume that needs to be displaced, higher volume of liquid to be displaced. All the density of liquid displaced has to be higher. Okay, because you can see from here, uptrust depends on density. Density of liquid is higher, uptrust is higher. It also depends on volume. The more volume you displace, the higher your uptrust. Okay. So if you look at your answer choices A, B, C, D, which one is actually telling you? either one of this where you 
cause a higher volume to be displaced or you cause the density of liquid to be higher. So here they tell you decrease the density of the plot for A. This is nothing sensible. Uh, this one doesn't really have any effect on our up trust because you see, this is density of the block. It only causes the weight of the block to decrease, but up trust remains unchanged. You're still displacing the same liquid. You're still displacing the same volume. Up trust is unchanged. So A is not the answer. And now that they tell you hold the block horizontally, this also doesn't change the up trust because you're still displacing the same volume of the same liquid. So hold the block horizontally doesn't change anything. Now, if you were to increase Y, meaning to say this part here is increased, this means you are going to have a larger volume of the block. Larger volume of the block means larger volume of liquid displaced, so larger weight of liquid displaced. Here, larger weight of water displaced now. Can they say you were putting in water, right? So larger weight of displaced water, therefore our trust increases. So if anything, I'll probably just write it here. Lah. When Y increase volume of water displaced increase. So hence weight of water displaced increase. Up trust will increase. Okay, you increase Y, volume of water displaced will increase because the volume is larger. So volume of water displaced is larger, where water displaced is larger, therefore our trust increase. Okay, so answer would be C. That one is the correct one over here. Now increase the density of the block. This one is actually the direct opposite of A. So this one, we already, I, we already know that you increasing the density of the block won't change your up trust. Instead, increasing the density of the block now will only increase the weight of the block. Okay, up trust still remains unchanged. Okay, so this one is okay. Right, so there are some further answers here like that I said. Changing the density of the block only affects the weight of the block. It doesn't affect the weight of the displaced liquid, so no change in the up trust. And then changing orientation of the block doesn't affect the weight of the block, nor the up trust. Okay, since uh, up trust doesn't change because weight of liquid displaced remains the same. Okay, so these answers here, you can actually just uh, refer to Google Drive and copy it later on, okay? I just tell you the concepts first. Okay, now number 12. A shelf XY is 0.4 meter long and is attached to a wall at NX. It's kept horizontal by a wire attached to Y and to the wall as shown. The tension force in the wire is 15 newton at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. What's the moment of this force about point X? So here they want you to specifically find the moment of the 15 Newton force about point X. So basically this X is now your pivot. You are finding the moment of this 15 Newton force about this pivot. So in your case here, usually what we'll do is that we resolve the forces into horizontal and vertical direction. So the component of the, the horizontal force is adjacent to the angle, so it's 15 cos 30. The vertical force, if you put it here to complete the triangle, is opposite to your angle, so it's sine. Okay, so this is 15 sine 30. Okay, so these are all your relevant forces. Then after that, one thing to note is this, the 15 cos 30 will pass through your pivot, so it will not be considered in your calculation. Okay, The reason for that is because 
there is no perpendicular distance. Therefore, no moment to consider. Okay, because moment is zero. You really only need to consider the 15 sine 30. So in our case, this is the force. Our perpendicular distance is 0 0.4. So moment is going to be 15 sine 30 times 0 0.4 equals to 3 newton meter. So answer is 8. Okay, so that one is okay. Now, number 13, a statement about the principle of moments with some words omitted is shown where they say that for an object in a state of rotational equilibrium, the sum of clockwise moments about any point is equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moments about the same point, okay? So this one is basically just complete the blank, okay? Sum of clockwise moments about any point is equal to sum of anti clockwise moments about the same point. Okay. The other thing that you would have meant, uh, may have seen before this was this. If you're talking about equilibrium, where we say that there are two conditions. We say there are no resultant force in any direction. Okay. Which in turn means this now sum of fx is zero, sum of fy is zero. The second one was no resultant moment about any point okay so this one means sum of clockwise moments this one means sum of moments is zero la. okay but you can also think of it as this sum of clockwise moments is equals to sum of anti-clockwise moment about the same at the same point okay uh, at the same point okay so just be careful about how they word the things you say that no resultant moment about any point as condition for equilibrium, then it's correct. But if you're talking about clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment, that is for the same point. Okay. So that one should be fine. Okay. Then after that, you look at number 14. Yeah, number 14, you have a bird that dives. Just erase this. You have a bird that dives to a depth of 1.5 meter below the surface of the lake. Atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascal. The density of water is 1000 kg per meter cube. What's the pressure at this depth? Okay, so say for example that this is the surface of your lake. The bird actually dove 1.5 meter below the surface of the lake. Okay, so it dive 1.5 meter below the surface of the lake until this point. So what is the pressure at this point here? So you have to consider two different pressures. The first pressure you need to consider is the pressure due to the water, which is H rho G. And then you also need to consider atmospheric pressure acting on top of the lake, on, on top of the surface of the lake. So pressure at this point here will actually be the pressure of water as well as the pressure of atmosphere added together. So pressure of water is just H rho G. Pressure of atmosphere is really given to you. 
as 101 kilopascal. So you just sum in the equations, you will get 1.5 times 9.81 times 1000 plus 101 times 10 power 3 because you're changing kilo pascal to pascal. Eventually, you're getting 116 times 10 power 3 pascal, which is 116 kilo pascal. So answer is D. Okay. So that one should be fine. Okay, so that one is all right. Then after that, we go to number 15. So let me just clear off whatever I have here. Now, which statement about energy is not correct? Okay, now energy is never lost, but it may be transferred between different forms. This is principle of conservation of energy is correct. In an elastic collision, the total energy is constant. This one should also be correct. Total energy will always remain constant, regardless of what happens. Okay. Now, then after that, number uh, for C, the efficiency of a system is the ratio of useful output energy to total input energy. This one is also correct. This is how we define efficiency. Okay. Now. When a machine does work, friction reduces the total energy. This one, as I mentioned to you, total energy of any system will always remain constant. Okay? Total energy of any system always remains constant, okay? It applied to the case for in, in elastic collision. It should also apply for this case here where you, you have a machine that does work. Your total energy will always remain constant. But here, they tell you friction is actually re re reducing your total energy. This one is actually wrong, okay? So if anything, you can probably just think of it as this. Friction actually increases your energy loss, thereby reducing useful energy available. Okay, if you say that friction increases energy loss, that one is correct. If it reduces useful energy available, that is also correct. Okay, that is the proper term to use. We do not say total energy has reduced. Total energy remains constant. Okay, because if we try to look at it another way, total energy is can be divided into useful energy and energy loss. Okay, so if we have friction, it merely increases the energy loss and then reduces the useful energy that we have. But the total still remains the same, okay? Before and after, okay? So it will also apply for the case of your inelastic collision that the total energy should remain constant. It's just that maybe you have more energy loss after the collision, and then you have less useful energy left, but the total added up should still be the same as before, okay? So this one is, oh, Right, so this is number 15. So I'll clear this one off. Okay, number 16. You have a pulley of radius 0 0.4 meter that supports a weight of 20 newton and 15 newton by means of a thin string. The weights are slowly moved by rotating the pulley clockwise through an angle of 60 degrees like the ones that is being shown here. What is the increase in total gravitational potential energy of the weights? Okay. What is the increase in GPE value? So if the thing here is that our object is moving, the question say your pulley is moving clockwise in this direction by an angle of 60 degrees. That would mean that in our case, this weight is dropping down. 
but this weight is going up. Okay, one is moving down, one is moving up. For the weight that is moving down, GPE should drop. But for the weight that is moving up, GPE should increase. Okay, because uh, this one here, we look at the increase or decrease in height. Okay, so, uh, for the 20 Newton, we say there's an increase in height, therefore GP increases. But for the 15 Newton, there's a decrease in height, therefore GP decreases. We look at the height change, okay? Whether it's increasing or decreasing. That one will tell us whether we are going to have GP increase or decrease, okay? Now, so if one of them is increased, then that one will be positive, no? If one of them is decreased, then one of them, then this one will be negative. No? When we want to add them up together. So we know that MGH would be our GPE. Okay. We already know the weights for both of them. What we're just missing is the height change or rather the distance move. This one you need to use a bit of maths uh, for circular motion. If this one a bit of maths from cir from circular, okay, not circular motion. If you remember this thing here, because they told us that the pulley is now rotated through an angle of sixty degrees. If your pulley is rotated by an angle of sixty degrees, what is the distance that has been moved? This one, we know that we think of it this way, lah, okay? If this is your pulley, if it moves 360 degrees, the distance move is actually the circumference of your circle, which is 2 pi r. So what we're interested to know is how much distance would you have moved if it was 60 degrees? So you do something like ratio, where you say that 60 over 360 times 2 pi r, you sum in the values, you're going to get the answer is 0 0.419 meter. Okay. This is the distance with which you would have moved. Your distance would have, your, your pulley would have moved a distance of 0 0.419 meter. So it also would mean this now your weight 15 newton would move down by a distance of 0 0.419 meter your weight of 20 newton would have moved up by the same distance of 0 0.419 meter okay that's the reason why you need to find this one here so you sum in everything now using mg delta h you take the weight multiply by the distance move for 20 newton minus all the 15 newton weights multiply with the distance flow, you're going to get the answer as 2.1 joules. So this is the total change in the GPE. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Now we are at question 17. You have a car of mass 1,500 kg that accelerates from an initial speed of 50 meter per second. This acceleration causes the car to gain 3 times 10 power 5 joules of kinetic energy. What is the change in speed of the car? Okay, so they want you to find out the change in speed of the car, given that you know that you have a gain in kinetic energy of 3 times 10 power 5 joules for the initial speed of 15 meters per second. So we can actually do something like this. Change in kinetic energy was 3 times 10 power 5. Change in kinetic energy is actually the final Ke minus the initial Ke, which will be half mv square minus half mu square equals to 3 times 10 power 5. Then after that, you try to simplify it, you factorize out the mass, you have one, you, you would have half times 1500 times mv square minus 15 square, giving you 3 times 10 power 5. So you solve this one, you're going to get velocity is 25 meter per second therefore your change in velocity will be 25 minus 15 giving me 10 meter per second so the answer is just b okay 
So this one's pretty straightforward. Now, number 18, this one also, I think, also pretty straightforward. You have a car of mass 1,500 kg that travels at constant velocity of 30 meter per second down a slope. This slope is at an angle of 6 degrees to the horizontal as shown. The magnitude of the total resistive force acting on the car is 2,000 newton. What is the power output of the car's engine? Okay, so what is the power output of the car's engine given that this car was moving at constant velocity 30 meters per second down the slope? So a few things to note here. For this kind of question, wherever you have a slope, you always try to resolve forces parallel to and perpendicular to the slope. So if I know that this car had a weight of say mg, I can actually resolve it into two perpendicular components, one parallel to and one perpendicular to the slope. So I would have mg sine theta here and a, wait, I actually labeled this wrongly. I would have mg cos theta here. And then after that, I would have mg sine theta here. Okay. So remember last time, I always tell you, always remember that if let's just say you have an angle of theta here, and then after that, you have a block here whose value is mg. Once you resolve it, this angle will always be this angle here. Okay, so that this one would now be mg cos theta. This one is mg sine theta. Okay, right. So you're doing the same thing here. If we already know that this one is six degrees, this one will also be six degrees. Okay. So this one is mg cos theta or mg cos 6 degrees. This one is mg sine 6 degrees, All right? Now, one of the things we know is that the object was moving with constant velocity. So that means our net force is zero. No uh, constant velocity means no acceleration. No acceleration means net force is zero. So the forces must be balanced. In other words, what this does, what this would then mean to us is that force diagonally down the slope will be the same as force diagonally up the slope. Okay, so we just identify all the forces diagonally down and diagonally up. So we can actually see those forces here. Mg sine theta is diagonally down. And then after that, you would have the force exerted by your car engine. F, okay. They are asking you the power output of the car's engine. So as your car is moving down, your weight is acting down the slope. The force exerted by your car engine is also acting down the slope. So here you would have mg sine theta plus F. This would be balanced by some other force diagonally up the slope. That one would be your 2000 Newton. So I would say that mg sine theta plus f is equals to 2000. These forces all add up will give me zero resultant force. Okay, so just sub in the values. 1500 times 9.81 times sine 6 plus with f equals 2000. So f is 462 Newton. So this one, you need to find power. Okay, power is force of the car engine multiply with the speed with which your car is moving, it will be 462 times 13, giving you 13.9 times 10 power 3 watts. Change to kilowatt is actually 13.9 kilowatt, or rather it's 14 kilowatt. Okay, so that one should be okay. Okay, so this one is okay. Yeah, I think I better just make a mention here. Mm. Okay, I didn't mention this, right? This is force exerted by car engine, okay? So F is force exerted by car engine. 
Okay, so this one is fine. And move on to the next one, question 19. All right now, a metal wire or cross sectional area A and unstretched length L is subjected to stress sigma. As a result, it has the strain of epsilon. Which expression gives you the Young modulus of the metal? So this one is a, something like bonus question. Now. I mean, Young's modulus is just ratio of stress to strain. So answer is the C. Nothing to it. Okay. So this one is fine. Okay. Then after that, you have number 20. Two identical springs are connected in parallel. A weight of 8 Newton is hung from the combination as shown. The graph shows you the variation with length of the force applied to one of the springs. What's the string? Uh, what's the strain energy in one of the springs? Okay, so they're really talking about just one of the springs only. All right. So this graph is for one spring. They want the strain energy in one spring itself. Okay. So when you look at the graph, just be careful about whether it's a force extension graph or a force length graph. You see, this is a force length graph. It is not extension graph, okay? So here, you just need to be careful, all right? Now, your springs are arranged in parallel, this one and this one. You apply a force of 8 Newton. This 8 Newton is going to be split equally between the two springs so that each spring is actually supporting 4 Newton. So right now, you want to find out the strain energy in one spring only. Okay, and this graph gives you the force versus length of one spring. Okay, so they want the strain energy in one spring you can actually just find out the energy directly from this graph. Okay, so first thing we need to do is to convert this force versus length to force versus extension. Now, if our force was 4 Newton, you just look at the 4 Newton mark, extrapolate until here, go down, your length will be 7, okay? So if now you're trying to plot a graph of force versus extension for one graph, it will look like this. At zero Newton, you do not have any extension, but at four Newton, your extension is three because you take seven minus with four. This one will give you three centimeter, okay? So this is your graph. It will be a straight line. So strain energy is area under your graph under your force extension graph, so it's the area of a triangle is half times four times three times 10 power minus two, you're gonna get 0 0.24 joules. Okay, so this one is okay. All right, so this one, no particular difficulty. Okay, now 21, you have two balls that float on the surface of the sea. The balls are separated by a distance of 1.3 meter. The wave travels on the surface of the sea so that the balls move vertically up and down. The distance between a crest and an adjacent trough of the wave is 0 0.9 meter. What's the phase difference between the two balls? Okay. So right now, The one of phase difference between the two balls, right? Uh, you need to find out your wavelength first. The question already mentioned that distance between crest and the trough is 0 0.9. So it basically means something like this. From crest to trough is 0 0.9. So this one is actually equivalent to half a wavelength from crest to trough. You want to find one whole wavelength in the first place. So if I tell you that this one is half wavelength, you want to find 
the whole wavelength lambda so all you just need to do is that lambda is just 0 0.9 times 2 if crest to trough is 0 0.9 trough to crest is also going to be 0 0.9 also okay so this two added up will actually give me my whole wavelength so i multiply with two for 0 0.9 giving me 1.8 meter so from here i can actually find the phase difference so phase difference is basically fraction of a cycle in which one point leads or lacks the other right so remember i always tell you find out the fraction of the cycle first find fraction of cycle then convert to degrees find the fraction of the cycle first then convert to degrees so you're trying to find the phase difference between this and this and the distance is 1.3 okay so compare this distance of 1.3 with respect to one cycle meaning to say with respect to one wavelength it will be 1.3 divided by 1.8 so this one is your fraction of a cycle already okay then you want to convert it to degrees you multiply with 360 giving you 260 degrees so we know one cycle is 360 degrees okay right so answer is going to be d nothing difficult okay number 22 which statement about transverse and longitudinal waves are not correct you want to find out the statement that's wrong so longitudinal waves can be used to demonstrate diffraction longitudinal waves are like sound waves yes you can use them to demonstrate diffraction diffraction occurs for both longitudinal and transverse wave okay so this one is okay now transverse waves can form stationary waves this one is also a correct statement trans uh Longitudinal or transverse wave also both can form stationary waves. Transverse waves can transfer energy. This is also correct. They never told us whether it's stationary waves, you see. So yeah, unless they told us stationary transverse waves can transfer energy, uh, only then it will be wrong. But here they didn't tell us that it is a stationary wave. They just gave us a general uh general term saying transverse wave it could be progressive wave it could be trans uh, it, it could be progressive wave, it could be stationary waves but it is true that progressive wave can transfer energy so here d is also considered to be correct okay right then after that the one that is wrong is b la. longitudinal waves can travel in a vacuum Longitudinal waves as sound cannot travel in a vacuum. So B is definitely out. Okay. Okay, number 23. You have a glass tube that is closed at one end and has a loudspeaker at the other. A stationary wave is formed with a node at the closed end of the tube when the sound has frequency of F0. There are no other nodes. The frequency of sound is then slowly increased. What's the frequency of sound that produces the next stationary wave? So this is a case where length is fixed, but frequency increase. Right? This one length fix, but frequency increase. So they tell you that they form a stationary wave, the node is at the close end, and then there are no other nodes in between. Okay, so that one already tells you that the stationary wave that is formed is just going to be this. 
Okay, because they told you there are no other nodes. There's only one node at the close end. Okay, so the open end obviously must be empty node. No? Okay, so close end is no, open end is empty node, no other nodes. So this is the first stationary waveform actually. Then they tell you that the frequency is slowly increased up to the next stationary wave. So when you want to get the next stationary wave, the pattern will be this one. Okay. You will still have a node and empty node at both ends. But then what will then happen is that how has your wavelength changed? What how has your wavelength changed? So remember that your length remains the same, okay? So if you look at the first stationary wave, node and empty node, this is lambda over four equal to L. So lambda is for L, and this one is occurring at frequency F naught over here. They've already told you it's frequency F naught. So if you go and increase it to the next stationary wave, this is now your new pattern. This one is actually going to be three quarter lambda. As you can see over here, lambda over four, lambda over four, lambda over four. You will actually have three quarter lambda equals to L. So lambda is four L over three. Now, before this lambda was four L, now it's four L over three you can see that lambda has decreased by three times. So frequency therefore must increase by three times. Because what you also know was that frequency is always inversely proportional to your wavelength. So if one of them drops, the other must increase by the same amount. So your new frequency will therefore be three F naught. Okay, answer is D. Right, so that one is okay. So I'll clear this one off. Okay, with which waves can Doppler effect be observed? Doppler effect can be observed for all waves, including sound, including light, including longitudinal waves, and including transverse waves. Now, if you think about it, okay. So answer is just A for twenty-four. Now 25, which radiation could consist of waves of wavelength 0 0.5 nanometer? This one is the question that requires you to recall your EM wave spectrum. So I mentioned to you guys before, paper one will always have one or two questions that test your knowledge in your EM wave spectrum with which you need to reproduce the spectrum. So this is one of it. So I mentioned to you, always draw some vertical lines. And then after that, always start with 10 power three and then divide by 10 power three each time. So 10 power three, 10 power zero, 10 power minus three, 10 power minus six, 10 power minus nine, 10 power minus 12, 10 power minus 15. There will always be one special exception in between 10 power minus six and 10 power minus nine, which is 10 power minus seven. Then power minus seven is because you need to take into account the presence of visible light. We know that wavelength of visible light is 400 to 700 nanometer, which is four to seven times 10 power minus seven meter. This is where your 10 power minus seven comes from. Okay. So then after that, you just sub in the spaces law. Raging Martians invade Venus using X-ray gun. So the first letter of each word represents the wave. Radio wave, microwave, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma rays. So they tell you wavelength 0 0.5 nanometer. You try to change it to meter. 0 0.5 times 10 power minus 9 meter is actually 10 power minus 5 times 10 power minus 10 meter. It's actually somewhere here. So it's actually X-ray, okay? Yeah, I also need to mention this. Going towards the right is always where your wavelength decreases, no? okay? Mm. 
the values I write here is more is for the wavelength values. Okay. All right, 25 is okay. Then we go on to the next one. 26 is stationary wave again. All right, now 26 stationary wave. A string is fixed between point P and an oscillator M. Another string is fixed between M and point Q. M is midway between P and Q. The frequency of the oscillator is adjusted until a stationary wave is formed on both strings. The speed of the wave between P and M is twice the speed of the wave between M and Q. Which diagram could represent the stationary pat wave pattern form? Okay. So what is the stationary wave pattern that we can expect to see? So you are going to get a stationary wave at P and M and also at Q and M. But then there's a difference here right now. The speed with which the waves travel on both strings are not the same. Between P and M, the speed is twice the speed between M and Q. Okay. So here, what's happening is this. Your oscillator move up and down. So as it moves up and down, over P and M is going to cause a wave to travel to this direction. It hits the wall, it gets reflected back. So you have incident and reflected wave, you're going to get stationary wave. The same can also be said for Q and M. As the oscillator moves up and down, it's going to send a wave to this side. It hits the wall, it reflects back. So now you have incident and reflected wave again. By right, you are going to get stationary wave too. Okay, so that's how you get two different stationary waves on both sides right now. So they want you to determine the shape of the stationary wave that you could get. All right. So one of the things that you should see is this. Because P and M and M and Q are connected to the same oscillator, that would mean the frequency of the waves are constant for both strings. So you look at the equation V is equals to F lambda. Frequency is constant. That would mean that V will be proportional to wavelength. If we know that while the speed here is twice, the other, that would mean that if V increase by two times, the wavelength will increase by two times. So I know that PM is having twice the speed. VPM is, maybe I write it here. VPM is two times the speed of VMQ. Okay, so this would thus mean that lambda VPM is two times lambda MQ. Okay, this is how I came to this conclusion here. Because PM has twice the speed, this wavelength should be twice that of MQ also. So which diagram could represent the stationary wave pattern form? You just look at the stationary wave here. Which one is telling you this story? one wavelength of PM is the same as two wavelengths of MQ. Okay. Now the answer will actually be A. La. I can actually do look at it this way. Lambda VPM is two times lambda MQ. If I divide by half for both sides, this one would mean half lambda VPM is just lambda MQ, which is what you're seeing over here. So this one, yeah, I better just do this. This one is half lambda PM. This blue color line here. And then this green color line is the full wavelength MQ. Okay. The rest won't fit. Okay, the rest won't satisfy the relation here. Only A satisfies the relation. Okay, so that's how I look at this one. Okay, so 26 is okay. Then we move on to 27. Okay. 
So if you're okay with this, I move on to 27. Okay, 27. A water in a ripple tank is diffracted as it passes through a gap in the barrier. What two factors affect the angle of diffraction of the wave? Okay. The wavelength of the wave and the width of the gap. No? Relative size between wavelength and gap width affects the amount of diffraction or angle of diffraction. What we know is that if they are comparable, meaning to say they are the same order of magnitude, usually significant diffraction would occur. Okay, So the only thing that affects angle of diffraction is wavelength and the width of the gap. There's actually one equation last time I mentioned to you to, that you can use to evaluate how much is your diffraction. That one, let me just open it up a little. It's the ratio of your wavelength to lambda. If I'm not mistaken, it is W over lambda. But let me check for you. Is it superposition? Should be, yeah. Sorry, not W over lambda. It's, w, it's lambda over W. There was this equation last time I mentioned to you. If you want to check the amount of diffraction, you take the ratio of wavelength to W, the bigger it is, the bigger the diffraction. Okay, so these two affects your diffraction. Angle of diffraction refers to this. If this one is your wave passing through the barrier and it diffracts, angle of diffraction kind of looks like this. If you draw a line, straight line like this, this one is your wave that is bent, right? This is your normal line, right? The, the original line, right? This is your angle, okay? So the more bending you have, the bigger your angle, right? That's why we call this the angle of diffraction, okay? How much has your wave actually bent from the original straight line, okay? So answer for 27 is D. Wavelength and wave photo gap. Okay, so that one is okay. Okay, then we go to number 28. Now, 28, they tell you that light of wavelength lambda is incident normally on two narrow slits, S1 and S2, a small distance apart. Bright and dark fringes are observed on the screen a long distance away from the slits. They tell you the end dark fringe for the center bright fringe is observed at point P on the screen. Which equation is correct for all positive values of N? Okay. So this one, I think I did mention to you guys before. Last time when it came to constructive and destructive, I mentioned this before. Oh, when you are constructive, which means bright fringe, your path difference is going to be 0, lambda, 2, lambda, 3, lambda, in other words, n lambda. But then after that, when you came to destructive, your dark fringe, it was mentioned that your path difference is lambda over 2, 3 lambda over 2, 5 lambda over 2, 7 lambda over 2. In other words, it was n plus half lambda, where n was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? Now, right now they tell you the n dark fringe, right? which is basically talking to you about your destructive. So the equation that is correct for the dark fringe, when destructive interference occurs, in terms of the path difference, if you remember what I wrote in the notes, I said it was n plus half lambda. In our case here, if you look at this diagram, to point P here, the wave from S1 will have to travel this distance. 
the way from S2 will have to travel this distance. There's a difference in the distance that they travel. So there's actually a path difference. So the path difference determines whether this one will be a constructive or destructive interference, whether it will be a bright fringe or dark fringe. So the one that I wrote in the notes was M plus half lambda. So if you remember that, you would have probably wrote your answer as this. S2P minus S1P is M plus half lambda, but this is not the answer, okay? The answer is actually supposed to be C. S2P minus S1P is N minus half lambda. Because here, the N does not include zero. They say for all positive values of N, it does not include zero. So you mentioned that if I try to use uh, use n equals to one into this one, you know, what I mean by that is this. Okay, like you think of it this one. Uh, for n plus half, maybe I rewrite this, let me just rewrite this. If n is 1, 2, 3, 4, for n plus half lambda, your path difference would be 3 lambda over 2, 5 lambda over 2, 7 lambda over 2. So where is lambda over 2, okay? But if your expression was, you know, I need to find a suitable color, okay. For n minus half lambda, your path difference is going to be lambda over 2, 3 lambda over 2, 5 lambda over 2, 7 lambda over 2, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so you see, that's the reason why we do not use n plus half lambda here. Because if your n is starting from 1, you will be missing lambda over 2. Okay, if you sub in 1 into this expression, the first value you start off with for your path difference is 3 lambda over 2. Your lambda over 2 is missing. Okay, so it's incomplete. But if you start off with n minus half lambda, you sub in for one, you will start with half lambda already. And then the subsequent ones will continue. So this one is considered to be complete. Okay, so that's why the answer is C. All right, so just be careful a bit uh, about the n that they're talking about. Actually, another thing that could also tell you that your n does not have zero is this one. Uh. You see, this one, they tell you n dark fringe. If they say n dark fringe, this one will be starting from one already. There is no zero dark fringe, zero order dark fringe. It's always from one, okay? So there are two things that will tell you it will start from one. Either this one, all positive values of n, or the, the fact that they tell you is n dark fringe it will start from one. There is no zero, okay? Right, so that one is okay. Right, so I'll just clear this one off. Okay, now for 29, you have green light that is incident normally on the diffraction grating. And forms a diffraction pattern on the distance screen. Which change on its own will decrease the separation of the diffraction maxima on the screen? Which change will actually decrease your separation of your maxima? So this is, since this one is diffraction grating, you cannot use this one. Huh? Lambda is AX over D. This one is only for double slit. Okay. For diffraction grating, we will use d sine theta equals to n lambda. This is for diffraction grating. 
Okay, so this is the one that we use. Now, when they're talking about the separation of the diffraction maxima, in our case here, this one will actually refer to the angle. Okay, you will have to refer to the angle. So here, they want the separation to decrease. If we just look at the angle, we look at this one. Separation decrease means angle theta will decrease. Therefore, sine theta decreases. If you look at d sine theta equals to n lambda, where sine theta is n lambda over d, if you want sine theta to drop, n must drop, lambda must drop, or d must increase. So you look at the answer choices here, which of these, uh, which of the answer choice actually gives, gives you this? So you can just think of it as this. You just look at answer choice B, C, D first. A, this one I'll explain later. Now, replace the diffraction grating with a grating that is smaller separation between the slits. Meaning you say D is decreased, but we want D to increase here. So this one is out. You look at D, replace the green light with red light. Now, remember the visible light spectrum, Roy GB, we're going towards the right, is wavelength decrease. You have green light and yellow, uh, green light and red light, right? Red light is here, green light is here. So if you replace green light with red light, you're going from here to here. Red light has a larger wavelength. So this one is saying that you are using a larger wavelength, which is not what you want. You want a smaller wavelength. So D is also out. Okay. So what about C? C, replace the diffraction grating with a grating that has fewer slits per unit length. Now fewer slits per unit length, this one is talking about your N, okay? Now, we know that N is related to D by this equation. D is 1 over N. If your N drops, your D will increase. So this is what we want. Isn't it? We want D to increase. So answer is C. Okay. N drops. D decrease, uh, sorry, D increase. So that is what we want. Okay, now what about A? A doesn't factor into the equations here. Okay, it doesn't factor into the equations that we've, uh, that, that was written here. Some has to do a bit with some common sense. Now A, they say increase the distance between the screen and the diffraction grating. Okay, now, you think of it this way. If this one's the original screen, okay, you think of this as the original screen, and this is where you have your diffraction grating. When your green light came in, it's going to diffract and it's going to give you the lines like this, okay? It's going to diffract in along these lines here, okay? Now your screen originally was placed here. So you're gonna see your diffraction, you're gonna see your maxima at these points here, right? So right now the question says you are trying to increase your distance between your screen and your diffraction grating, meaning you say this screen is now placed here, okay? Your screen is now placed right over here right now. This is the new location of your screen. But you see, because your lines, uh, your light is diffracting in a straight line like this at an angle, the further away you are, you will notice that your maxima, the separation is actually increasing. If let's just say before this, it was like this, now it's like this, it's bigger already. Okay, so the 
question wants your separation to drop to decrease you putting the screen away isn't causing the separation to decrease it's actually causing it to increase so that's why a is wrong okay this one doesn't need equation to prove it you can actually just see from the diagram itself okay so 29 is c so this one should be okay okay so i'll just clear off whatever we have here okay now the next few questions 30 electric field strength is not in your syllabus anymore it's in a2 31 is also an electric field strength is also no longer in your as it's in a2 so 31 uh, 30 and 31 you can skip it's not in syllabus anymore okay so the next one you can do is question 32 okay so we go to question 32 question 32 is on your drift velocity okay well now we tell you this Right, next door is doing some renovation. Okay, current I in the wire is given by this equation. I is NABQ, where N is the number density of your free electrons, A is the cross-sectional area of the wire, B is the average drift velocity of free electrons, and Q is the charge of an electron. Which relationship is not used in the derivation of this equation? Now, if you recall the derivation of your drift velocity, under current of electricity it looks something like this okay it looks something like this okay so the question is asking you which relations weren't used in the first place so let's just start from there how we derive the drift velocity we say that current is actually charge over time this one we say that current is actually charge over time which is actually a if we rearrange this charge is actually current over time then after that charge will be number density times volume times q divided by t so then after that volume is area times length times q divided by t then after that, we group L and T together, where we subsequently say that L and T, L over T is actually equals to velocity, giving us NABQ. So this one here was us saying that speed is distance over time. It's actually this one it rearrange again okay so we use current is charge over time shown here we use p is distance over time shown here and then after that we also use volume right where we say that volume is area times length which is shown over here. The only thing we never use is C, where we say number is number density times area. This is actually wrong. The correct relation that was supposed to have been used was this, number of charge carriers is equals to number density times volume not area the one thing that is wrong here is area it should have been volume but they say it's area okay so that one is okay right so 32 is done let me move on to 33 we can probably squeeze in another one or two questions okay now 33 you have a circuit that contains two resistors P and Q and the power supply of negligible internal resistance as shown. The current of resistor P is 2 amps and the power dissipated by resistor P is 18 watts. Resistor Q dissipates 240 joules of energy when a charge of 40 coulomb passes through it. What's the EMF of the power supply? This one you can actually just... You have to work out the PDs individually. 
if say for example i start with resistor p first knowing the power knowing the current i want to find the pd first so p is equals to vi 18 equals to v times 2 the pd is 9 volts across resistor p this is 9 volts then i move on to resistor q they say it dissipates 240 joules of energy when the charge of 40 coulomb passes through it so for resistor q the pd across it since i know the energy that has been dissipated and the charge that passed through it i can use v equals to w over q it's 240 divided by 40 equals to 6 volts so this one is 6 volt so the last thing i want to do is to find the emf e right you apply Kirchhoff's second law where you say that emf is equal to the sum of pd e is vp plus vq is 9 plus 6 giving me 15 volts so my final answer is 15 volts okay so this one is the final one done just like that right then the last question that we can still go through is 34 now for this one they tell you the iv characteristics or some of the graphs you know okay so this one they tell you the iv characteristics of two electrical components p and q again are shown which statement is correct so find out the correct statement we just see some of the stuff here okay now if we look at answer choice a for a current of 0.5 m the power dissipated in q is double that in p so how do we look at this one if you look at the same current going through both resistor uh current of 0 0.5 amps will give you these following voltages for p and for q okay so for current of 0 0.5 and 2p and q if i look at p equals to vi i here is the constant for both resistors i constant that would mean that p is proportional to v power is proportional to your voltage so i can see that vq this one is vq this one is vp vq is double that of vp therefore pq is double that of pp so this one is actually correct your power dissipated is double but what about the rest why are they wrong so let's just look at them again for b you know for current 1.9 amps the resistance of q is approximately half that of p so 1.9 amps is probably somewhere around here let me just indicate it for you 1.9 amps is probably somewhere around here it is actually kind of pointing towards the point where both lines intersect this is say that this one is 1.9 amps okay the graph p and q are intersecting when current is 1.9 amp at this point here p and q actually have the same values of v and i since resistance is the ratio of v and i r is actually the same for both you see they share the same value of v and i at this point when you're talking about point p and uh at this point here p and q have exactly the same voltage they have exactly the same current and since resistance is ratio of voltage to current their resistance is actually the same here they say it's half resistance q is half this is wrong there should be same resistance okay so then after that you look at answer choice c and d now c they tell you the resistance of q increases as the current in it increases this time you can actually just try and look at the gradient from the origin gradient from origin is i over v is actually one over r 
you look at how the 9q changes maybe this one i will draw it like this from here to here you notice that the gradient is actually increasing therefore the resistance is increase is decreasing so here they say the resistance increases this is wrong it should be decreasing okay and then after that they tell you for the last answer choice p is fixed resistor and q is filament lamp so in our case for p P is a fixed resistor. This one is correct. Because you see, P is this line here. It's getting a bit messy, sorry. P is this line here, right? It's a straight line. The gradient is constant, so resistance is constant. So this one, P being a fixed resistor is correct. But the problem is with Q, which is this line. So now we notice that the gradient is actually increasing therefore resistance decreases this one is actually semiconductor okay it's a semiconductor therefore it's semiconductor therefore is semiconductor so this one Yeah, okay. So the one that is wrong is this one. Huh? This one is actually supposed to be semiconductor. Yeah, I already wrote it here. Okay, so this is also out. Huh? Okay, now if you look at question 35, here we say that they are, you know, let me just zoom in. Okay, now under question 25, they said that there are two couple wires S and T of equal length, they are connected in parallel. Wire S has a diameter of 3 millimeter, while wire T has a diameter of 1.5 millimeter. A potential difference is applied across the ends of this parallel arrangement. So what is the value of the ratio of current in S to current in T? Okay, wait now. Okay, uh, hi, generally, you just joined in. We are continuing off from where we left off last week, uh, November 21, P11. We are under question 35, all right? Okay, yeah, back to this question. They tell you you have two couple wires, equal length, connected in parallel, and then they have a PD applied across the ends of this parallel arrangement. What is the value of the ratio of current in S to current in T? Okay, this one you make more sense if you were to look at the diagram, if you try to draw out the diagram. So what you know was that you had two different wires. They mentioned that you have wire S and wire T connected in parallel. So they apply a potential difference across the parallel arrangement. And then what they're interested to know is the ratio of the currents. So what you do know is that current will come out from here, from the battery, it reaches this junction and then it will split up. This one will have current IS, this one will have current IT. So what they want to know is the ratio of the currents of IS to IT. So this one, one of the main things that they mentioned to you was that the wires are connected in parallel. So this would tell you that they would actually have the same PD. If you know that this one here is V, the PD across each of the branches will also be V. I mean, we say this one will be V, this one will also be V. Okay, wait, the arrow is too big, okay. This one over T, the PD will be V, over S, the PD will also be V, okay. So now, I want to apply the equation B equals to IR for both of these wires, all right? 
So let's just say right now, I want to expand it a little because I have mentioned of length then. Notice that the question mentioned to you length, right? So you know that you probably need to make use of the resistivity equation. So what you want to do now is that your R, you substitute it as rho L over A. And then your area, you substitute it as pi over 4 D squared. So your resulting equation now becomes this. Now, from what you know, you know that the PD across each of the wires are the same. The length is the same as well as the resistivity. If you look at the question, they mentioned to you that the length was the same. And then also, they also told you that both of them are made of copper, meaning to say they're the same material. So if they're the same material, that means your row is constant here, okay? So that's why I can say rho, uh, V, rho, and L are constant. Eventually, you will come to this conclusion where you say that I is proportional to D squared, okay? So now from here, if you just think about wire S itself, you know, if you just look at wire S itself, they mentioned that the diameter of wire S is twice that of wire T. So since I is proportional to D square, it follows that if D increased by two times, I will increase by four times. It's basically two and then you square it. So you're getting four times. So your IS is actually for IT. They already mentioned to you the diameter is twice, right? Although they didn't directly mention, you can see from here. Uh, you see, YS has diameter of three, millimeter, wire T has diameter 1.5. Wire S is actually twice the diameter of wire T. That's why I can say that the diameter is double. Okay, so I know that wire S, D is double, I is quadruple. So I S is actually four times of I T. So now the ratio of I S to I T would be four. Okay, now if you don't like this way of doing things, I mean like the ones that I just did here, you can actually do it like this. Now. Since I know that I is proportional to this, square, I can just say that I S to I T is D S squared to D T squared. So D S was three millimeter, D T was 1.5. You sub them in, you square them. Eventually you also get the same answer as four. Okay, so it doesn't really matter how you want to use it. As I mentioned many times before, it depends on which one you are more comfortable with. Okay, so answer is four for question 35. Right, so that one is for this. Okay, then for 36, 36 this one is something like your common knowledge, you know, I think. They're asking you what is the circuit symbol for an oscilloscope. So in your syllabus, you are required to know what are the common symbols for certain electrical components. When you see this symbol here, this one is microphone. You see this symbol here with the wavy portion. The, you see a wave or rather inverted S here, right? This is an AC power supply. And then after that, this one here is your electric bell, okay? The question one specifically the symbol for an oscilloscope is actually this one. Okay. Now how do you know where to get the how to see where are how do you know what electrical symbols do you need to know? This one you actually can get it from your syllabus booklet. Wait, where is the syllabus booklet? Yeah, you may have gotten the syllabus booklet from college before at the beginning of your course the syllabus booklet is this one this one will tell you all the syllabus requirements okay so your circuit symbols are actually from here if you want to know where okay it is yeah it's from your syllabus booklet all you just need to do is you just press the search function inside your pdf type circuit symbols it will show you this page Okay, so these are all the circuit symbols that you need to know. Okay, a lot of times you will recognize all of them. Okay, 
It's just that some of the rare components like microphone, buzzer, electric bell, this one are not so common, so you may not know what are the symbols, but the rest of them are common symbols you have been encountering all this long. So this one depends on your luck, what are they testing, okay? All right, so uh, 36 answer is C. Now 37, this one is something else, okay? It's also on DC again. Now they tell you you have three identical cells. Each with EMF, E, and internal resistance R, they are connected as shown. What's the potential difference between X and Y? Okay. So now for this one here, they're asking you what is the potential difference between X and Y, meaning to say for this point and this point, what is the difference in their potential? Okay. Now, one of the things you would have learned is that when it comes to what we call PD, PD is difference in potential between two points, okay? So when you have a charge that passes through a cell, it tends to gain electrical potential, okay? But then when the charge passes through a resistor, it tends to lose electrical potential. This is one of the first things you learn in current electricity. Before this, I mentioned that EMF, or PD, they are really just differences in potential between two points. Okay, they are talk both talking about differences in potential between two points. But for EMF, what we say is that there are differences in potential between two points, but usually for EMF, there's a gain in potential because your charge gains electrical energy. But when you're talking about PD, it's also differences in potential, but here you have loss in PD because your charge is losing electrical energy, okay? So EMF is normally for battery. PD is normally for resistor or any kind of electrical component that displays electrical energy like lamp, or some other component, okay, but the common one is resistor, okay? So now, EMF is where you gain electrical potential. That's the first thing that you need to know. PD is when you, sorry, when your charge passes through your cell, it gains electrical potential. When your charge passes through a resistor, it loses electrical potential, okay? That's the main thing to know first, okay? Now, if you look at your circuit here, you can actually see that there are actually three equal parts. Okay, the whole circuit can be divided into three equal parts consisting of the cell internal resistance. What I mean by that is this. You see, this is one. This is the second one. And then this one is the third one. We know the color. This is the third one, okay? You can actually divide it into three equal portions, all right? So now, what you can actually just see from here is that from here all the way to here, the blue colored line here, once your charge tries to pass through, it will actually lose potential equal to E here and then it will gain potential equal to E here. So the net change between X and Y is actually zero, okay? Between X and Y, the charge will lose and then gain back the same amount of potential. So there's actually no change in PD, okay? Whatever you lost is the same as whatever you gain back, okay? So, this one is by symmetry, like you can see that there's a symmetry here. This one is, this circuit can be divided into three equal parts. Three equal parts, three e equal EMF, three equal internal resistance. So it's going to be the same in terms of what you gain and what you lose, okay? So this one answer is just A. Okay, so this one is okay. 
Okay, now just move on to the next one. Okay, another thing I could probably tell you why is it like this. If you try to apply Kutcho second law la, for this one here, where you say sum of EMF is equals to sum of PD, you actually have three E's here. Both are all of them are in equal directions, uh, in the same direction, sorry. This one is E plus E plus E plus VR plus VR plus VR. So 3E e equals to 3VR. So eventually the PD across your internal resistance is actually just equals to E. Okay. So this is another way of looking at it. Like why I say that. Why is it that the PD across R is actually equal to E? It's because if you apply Kirchhoff's second law, you eventually come to this conclusion. VR is actually the same as E itself, okay? So it will lose potential equal to E for the internal resistance. And then after that, when it goes to the battery, it will gain back potential equal to E, okay? Right, so answer is zero for this question. Okay, so this one is fine. Then after that, we we'll go to the next one. Next one is actually your potential meter. Okay. Now, here we tell you that potential differences across two resistors of resistances R1 and R2 are compared using a potential meter wire, which is a uniform resistor wire in the electrical circuit shown here. One terminal of a galvanometer is connected to point X. And then the galvanometer reads zero when its other terminal is connected to a point a distance 60 centimeter from one end of the potential meter. So what they basically mentioned here is that your galvanometer is at point X, this one, you have one terminal of galvanometer connected to point X, which is this one. And then it reads zero when it is a distance of six centimeter, 60 centimeter away from one end of the potential meter. Then the next one that they mentioned to you is this. You have a second galvanometer. One terminal of a second galvanometer is connected to point Y which is this one. The galvanometer reads zero while when its other terminal is connected to a point a distance of 80 centimeter from the same end of the potential meter wire. What is the ratio of R2 to R1? Okay, so your second galvanometer is connected at point Y here, but then it's connected, uh, it will be, the galvanometer will be zero when it is 80 centimeter away from the same end of the wire, okay? So what is the ratio R2 to R1? We want the ratio of this two, okay? So that is one thing to note here. Right, so one of the first things to note was that I mentioned to you before that for a potential meter, when you achieve balance length, one of the things that I mentioned was that current will flow in the circuit, but the currents don't actually mix. The top circuit will have its own current flow in a direction like this. It will be uh, it will be confined to this orange colored uh, loop here. The bottom circuit will also have its own uh, current flow, but it will be confined to this red loop here. At no point in time will they ever mix, okay? That's why I mentioned here. Current at the bottom circuit will not flow into the top circuit and vice versa, okay? The current at the bottom and, time, uh, and top will only flow within their respective circuit loop, okay? So that's one thing to note. Now, specifically for potential meter wire, which is this thing here, one of the relations you know is that the voltage across the length of the wire, the voltage is actually proportional to the length, okay? So here, what you do know is this. You are given two different lengths, right? One is the 80 centimeter, one is the 60 centimeter. 
but you need to be careful a bit about the voltage, right? Right now, I'm saying over here, yeah, I think it's better if I move on to resistors R1 and R2 first. Wait, now let me just jump a little. Now, if you look at resistors R1 and R2, you want the ratio of R2 to R1, right? Now, just now I mentioned to you that the currents at the top and bottom circuit do not mix. The, the current will only flow in their respective loop. So specifically, if I talk to you about the bottom loop, current will only flow like this. Now, if I apply V equals to IR for both of these resistors, I know that current flowing through both of them are constant, so voltage is directly proportional to R. If I want to get the ratio of R2 to R1, I need to get the ratio of their voltages, okay? So in my case here, R1 would have a voltage of V1. R2 would have a voltage of V2. So here, the thing is this. One of the things about potential meter was that you know that if this part here is V1, this part will also be V1 when you are at balance length. Okay. Then after that, this is where it's a bit different. When you have talking about voltage V2, at balance length, this one will be your V2. Okay. So these are the two different lengths representing the two different voltages. V1 is these two, V2 is this two. Okay. So now back to the original working before this. Uh, at number, at number one, we know that voltage is proportional to length. If I want to take the ratio of V2 to V1, which is this to this, I take the ratio of the length, which is 20 to 60. I don't take 80. Okay, I do not take 80 because 80 is actually V1 and V2 added together. Uh, 80 centimeter represents the voltage of V1 and V2 added together. That's not what you want. You want only voltage V2, which is actually just going to be the 20 centimeter here. Okay, so you need to do something like a small calculation here to find out this length, which is 20 centimeter. All right, so now V2 to V1 is L2 to L1, which is in turn equals to 1 over 3. So since R2 to R1 is V2 to V1, therefore the ratio is 1 to 3. Okay. Okay, so this one is your potentiometer. Right, the last two questions is on nuclear physics. So I'll just clear off some of the stuff here. Now, uranium-238 nucleus, this undergoes a series of nuclear decays to form uranium-234. What series of decay could give this result? All right. So this one, I think, is something where you have to do like trial and error. Okay. Now, notice what is happening here from uranium-238 to, yeah, from uranium-238 to uranium-234-92. The main change you notice here is that your nuclear number plus four, but then your proton number is unchanged. Okay. So this is the thing that was happening as a result of the series of nuclear decay here. From this part to this part, you actually have to have an increase in nuclear number of four while your proton number itself remains unchanged. Now, since your proton number remains unchanged, but your nuclear numbers are only added by four, this one could mean that your neutron 
number actually added by four. That's another way to look at it. Lah. All right. So now let's just have a look at this. Right now, if I want to go from uranium 23892 to uranium 23492, just like I told you, proper number, no change, but my, oh, sorry. I did a mistake here. Your neutral number reduced by four. Your nuclear number reduced by four, sorry. Okay, so how do you get the neutral number or nuclear number reduced by four? So they told you you have a series of nuclear decay, right? So here, you just do something like try and error. When you're talking about nuclear decay, you could have emission of alpha particles, beta particle, or gamma ray radiation. So one of the things that you could probably just do here is you do something like trial and error. Now, if you do emission of four beta minus particles, I think it's better you just do it one by one. You can just do this one by one. Yeah, I think you just do this uh, by trial and error. If I talk to you about answer choice A, I'll just write it at the top. Uranium 238.92 will give you, if you're saying four alpha particles, four beta particles, this one would be negative four. This one will be 92 minus negative four. It will become 96. Then 238 minus 0 become 238. So this one is clearly out of the question. Because this one added by, sorry. This one is clearly out of the question. We want minus 4 nuclear number, but no change in the proton number. But this one doesn't tell us that. So A is out. Now, and after that, if you're talking about uh, gamma, uh, gamma rays, uranium 23892 gives you gamma zero zero. Now gamma is by right having, does not have any neutron number. Or, it does not have any nuclear number or proton number because it's EM radiation, okay? So it's zero for both sides here. So this one, your uranium would just be 92 and 238. Again, this one is not what you want. Now if you do for C, emission of one alpha particle and two beta minus particle, you actually see the answer. Uranium 2392, if you have one alpha particle and two beta minus particle, eventually you will get the answer as uranium 23492. This one is 92 minus with two minus with negative two. So they kind of cancel all, giving you 92. This one will be 238 minus with four minus with zero. So just giving you 234. So this one is having nuclear number reduced by four, proton number unchanged. So this one is correct. Okay, now you repeat for D, you won't get the answer lah, because eventually you'll come to the conclusion that uh, proton number has increased by four, nuclear number is reduced by eight. Okay, so this one I won't do, all right, because we already got the correct answer. This one D definitely will be wrong, you can try at your own time later lah. Okay, so answer for 39 is actually C. Now last one. Which combination of up and down quarks form a proton? So this one is something like a bonus question. You already know that proton is up, up, down. So answer is just B. Okay. So this one is okay. All right, uh, maybe I try to do the, before I end this, maybe I try to work for you the D out first. Just give me one second. This one is uranium. 23892. If I have two alpha particles plus B, eight beta minus particles, what will I get here? This one by red will give me 242. This one will by right give me 
84. So how do I get this? This one was 92 minus off with 4 minus off with negative 8. Okay. Of nuclear proton number increased by 4, sorry. This one will actually give me 96. Okay. 92 minus 4 minus with negative 8. So overall, this one is plus 4. So our uh, proton number increased by 4. Then Newton number will be minus 8. So this one is 2, 3, 0. How do I get this? This one is 2, 3, 8. Minus with 8, minus with 0. So 2, 3, 0. Okay. So clearly this is not what we want. Okay. So this one is done. November 2021, P11, we are okay already. 